Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this session on multi-site horizon. We're going to be covering off some areas around the considerations you need to think of when deploying against multiple locations, multiple sites, and um, whether it's a single data center or a single campus network, so not doing stretched environments, for example, and some of the things you really need to keep in mind if you want to make sure you get a seamless environment as you move forward. Um, any questions, please leave them until the end. So firstly, who am I? So I'm Kyle Davis. I'm a solutions architect at CDW. Um, my role is to help customers to understand where they are today and where they'd like to get to and navigate the challenges within the technology and the operational structures they might have in place to deliver their outcome that they're trying to, to get to as a target operating model, whether that's from an operational standpoint or whether it's from a technical point of view as well. Um, I have blog sites. So I've this year been um, nicely sponsored by VMware to come here under a blogger pass. Um, I've got a YouTube channel and things that are stored as well, so the information is there. Feel free to follow, subscribe, all that usual kind of stuff. Uh, and, and give me some abuse and some questions if you really want to as well on there. VMware disclaimer, ultimately um, saying that this is a community slide deck. It's maybe not necessarily the referenceability that VMware want you to follow. It's not something that maybe my employer um, is on there. It's, it's my views and my thoughts ultimately on this engagement. So the areas we're going to cover today, as I mentioned, the engagement approach. So the first thing we need to think about in any of these engagements is how do we get you from A to B with minimal risk? So the first thing we need to talk about is how do we do that from a, a process perspective? Then we'll start talking around the basics of what is cloud pod architecture? How do we look to do a, a multi-site design? And what is a block and a pod to start with? Just in case people don't know what those are. Um, quick question in the audience, who runs Horizon already today? Okay, so quite a few of them. You probably know more than me, so you're more than welcome to come up and do this for me. Um, we've got some considerations, limitations. We're also going to do some top tips at the end. Um, and for anything you want any more information on, again, just reach out, and I'll be still at the side afterwards. So engagement approach. This is a familiar bit of information you've probably seen if you've looked at any of the VMware uh, documentation. So this is VMware's reference architecture for delivering a, a VMware Horizon environment, the processes you must follow in their eyes to deliver this. The key areas, from my perspective, is looking at the business drivers. Why are you making this change in the first place? How do you get the business case? What is the requirements of functional in business you need to do to get the right outcome for your users and your business? What you'll notice, though, on this wheel, there's something missing on all of this. So they talk about creating a business case, looking at your drivers, looking at your requirements, talking about how you're going to build it, you're going to design it, the infrastructure you need, all this information. But the one thing they don't mention is how are you going to get it right if you don't know what you've got? So in a workspace environment, as we're all aware, every user's workspace demand can vary. You can go from having 100 users per physical node to five users per physical node or even less if you're using GPUs to optimize the environment and using different um, profiles on a GPU for NVIDIA. So from, from my perspective on the way that I look at it, to simplify this down as the starting point, because the rest of that stuff is kind of typical design, low-level design, and getting signed off, looking at the operational structures. They're, they're typical things we've done in many other projects, right? There's nothing in that wheel that you haven't done before. But for me, it's, it's, it's looking at those business requirements why are you making that change in the first place? The functional requirements you need for your users to deliver the outcome. So let's just say, I want them to be able to have contextual access, or I want them to be able to roam across locations, across multiple countries, and hit the local desktop within that region. The question, though, is, is the services they use day to day, are they even in that region? Because if they're not, why give them a desktop in a region that they don't have any of their applications and data from? is going to provide you a substandard user experience depending on the use case that we've got from an application perspective. And we'll touch a bit on this in a bit later in this few slides. User desires. So this is one of the things that a lot of IT admins like we like to do. We like to make assumptions of what a user would like. As an organization, everyone says, oh, I want my users to work this way. And we always see that you try and force something on these users, they'll find a different way of doing it. And that's where the whole shadow IT element comes from, and you start struggling to, to maintain control over time. The good thing about looking at a Horizon environment like VDI or RDSH workloads is you as an admin, so long as you're not doing persistent and, and mapped users to a single VM, you have the control, and there's less shadow IT going to happen. The key thing, though, is ask them what they need. How are they working today? What's the user workflow? Do they want a 
a thin client on their desk or do they need a 13 inch lightweight laptop or a 15 inch heavier laptop for more power, more grunt, whatever it might be. They're the kind of conversations you need to be having even if you're going to a VMware Horizon environment. We need to understand that workflow, how they consume their services to give an optimal user experience. A suboptimal user experience is not going to deliver you your business outcomes. You're going to get productivity loss and we, no one wants that. The other one, as I mentioned, discovery is analytics. So last, I think it was last year, I did a presentation on um, driving workspace adoption. And we talked around how we could use various analytics tools in the market to understand a user's experience score. And how we can make sure that when we transition them from a, a physical endpoint potentially to a virtual model, how do we right size that? How do we get the right user experience that they're expecting when they move from this dedicated piece of tin to maybe a shared hosted model? Or a dedicated VDI session with GPU? If we take an example where and users generally, when you give them a laptop nowadays, they've got an Iris Pro kind of uh, GPU on there as a minimum starting point. When most people deploy a VMware Horizon environment, they don't have a GPU at all. So straight away, we need to start factoring in either GPU or, or put an additional CPU in there to try and counteract that potential loss of performance and density. Ultimately, when you're making these changes, the question always comes back to why are you making this change in the first place? Business continuity purposes is a, is a prime example. I want my users to be able to roam and work from anywhere in the case that they can't come into the office, there's bad weather or whatever it might be, then they can make sure they can do their job as if they were in the office, still keep them being productive. But taking it back for other than why is what it is you're trying to achieve as an IT admin, as an organization, and from a user perspective. If you always ask those why and what scenarios, then you keep asking that against every requirement that you put into your requirements capture then you're going to be on a good way to making sure you're going to deliver the outcomes that you'd expect to see at the end of an engagement. So some, some of the basics. What is multi-site? So multi-site is as simple as having multiple VMware Horizon implementations. If you think of it like that, that could be multiple countries. It could be multiple data centers in the same country. It could even be multiple um, environments on the same campus network. So if we take an example, and you'll see a bit later on on the limitations, you may want to actually create a, a multi-pod architecture within the same data center for resiliency, potentially, or even just to allow you to expand at a rapid rate if you're going to do lots of mergers and acquisitions. The other components you'll see a bit later on is that actually the limitations that you get are kind of bound to what vSphere and vCenter and maybe vSAN, if you're going down that route, can actually provide for you as well. So there's things like maximum of 200 VMs on a vSAN data store. Those kind of things can dictate then how many nodes you're going to have. So if we take an example, let's say we're going to get 50 users per physical server, you're going to be looking at around 14 to 16 physical um, nodes to deliver an outcome. As soon as you get to about, I think, a bit later, about 24 off the top of my head, you're looking at then starting another cluster anyway. And at that point, you don't need many users to get a 24 node cluster in most of the organizations today, if you put everybody on, so VDI is a prime example. We'll come again a little later. Deployment scenarios in this, this thing is a traditional kind of idea, active, 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 passive. There is other things around stretched. Stretch is not supported. Even on the same campus network, it's officially not supported by VMware. It will work, but it's not supported, okay? Um, if we look at active, active, and we'll come through some of these considerations in a moment. The key thing is, is why are you making it active active in the first place? Most people say, because my data center is active active. Okay, is that one line of business application that you run today available in both locations at the same time, referencing local database copies, whatever it might be? No, it's not. So actually, that one application is active passive, and 90% of your users use that as their main application, then why are you making your desktop infrastructure active active? It doesn't make any sense. So when we're working it from that kind of basis, it's looking at every single service you provide to a user and working out whether it's back-end resources are available for ActiveActive and isolated uh, delivery. And if they're not, then maybe look at a, a split model between um, a VDI implementation for your desktop in either location or multiple locations, and then use something like RDSH as a published application for the applications that only reside in each data center. So you're getting data locality, high performance for that application with a, a optimized desktop experience because you're connecting to your closest desktop in that region as a prime example. One of the things that um, a discussion I had with a customer a few months back was everyone always says, 
keep your uh, VDI workloads as close to the backend services they consume. If, let's just say that you're a user that's in um, Chicago and your data center is in the UK, so you're going to have, say, 200 plus milliseconds of latency. If it starts to have a little bit of a, a problem, shall we say, on that, on that link, and you're clicking your start menu, as users do, and it's not responding, you click it more, and then all of a sudden it starts flashing and going up, and it doesn't really respond very well. That's because that desktop experience is far away. Now think about it another way. Would you rather have your desktop experience consistent, but your application performance slightly degraded? Because the first thing a user is going to do is log in, start menu, office productivity suite. And all those ones generally will function without talking to your back-end application services. And then do RDSH, as I mentioned, for the applications on the back-end to talk back. And that way you're getting the best of both worlds for performance. It costs a little bit more because you've got a bit more resource being used, but it's a better experience that you can get at the back-end. From a, an active-passive point of view, that's probably most of the deployments that I've seen go out of the door. Most people still have, they may have a Metro cluster deployed somewhere for Active Active, but then the rest of the workloads at an application level are not Active Active aware, therefore they can't do it anyway. So same conversation again, why not just go Active Passive? Unless your RTO and RPOs are that intensive that you need to be doing that. And we'll see some examples in a moment. Pod and block architecture. What's a pod? What's a block? What's global entitlement? We'll come on to that in a second, but ultimately they are the building blocks that you would use to build out an environment. And the components within them are things like I was in a dynamic environment manager. It used to be UEM, right? It changed names not long ago. We look at things around Workspace ONE, we've got the AirWatch functionality in there, we've got a Horizon Enterprise, app volumes, we've got all these, these tools in our toolbox that we can use. How much of it do you actually need to build into the architecture? And actually, is any of those products active active aware as well? And we'll see a bit later on that actually they're not. So even at a VMware level from a Horizon perspective, you can't deliver Active Active for some of the services as well. Simple kind of layout. You'll notice that all the pictures on here are from VMware's documentation. The reason for that is because there's no point in one reinventing the wheel. But secondly, I, I feel that if you're going to speak at VMware, we'll use their slides and their information right, for this kind of stuff. A pod is a makeup of multiple blocks. A management block and a workload block or a worker block, if you think of it that way. They're the minimum two that you'll have in every single pod. You could have a single management pod, uh, block, sorry, and multiple worker blocks. So if we look up here, multiple ones. That could be an RDSH block, that could be a, a VI block with Horizon View, that one over there could be a mixed workload of some sort, whatever it might be. Scaling those out and getting them in the right locations. That could be a single data center. And that could be your secondary data center on the other side, active active or active passive, depending on the decisions that you've made. Global entitlement is where you federate two pods together. So pod one and pod two, making them have a, what they call a, a, a global data layer between the two. And they allow you to give entitlements in both data centers as a single resource. So it's not available to go to that location. You can home users. You can do that kind of stuff if you want to. But the idea is, is that you're still managing them today as two separate environments. Make a change in one, make a change in the other. That's where things like VMware um, Horizon Cloud Services comes in. The control plane. So some of these services here, the connection servers, the UAGs, the components that are in there, are moved out and abstracted into the Horizon Cloud Service. You then put a connection server or a cloud connector within your environment. It then pulls down the UAG, configures that locally in your environment. And then guess what? You can have this deployment. It's still called a pod. You just don't have this stuff, ultimately. And then that scales and is a single point of management then across all of your sites. Because Horizon Cloud is built natively on microservices, not on the on-premise stuff that we've seen today that we deploy on-premise. Just gives you an idea of the architecture you'd look to follow. So an active passive perspective. So these are some of the examples that I've seen and VMware have put on their, their, their public domain that you can go and see. But what would you look to do as a requirement for an active passive environment? We're talking around. Is it going to be VDI or RDSH? What's the maximum number of users we're going to have in there? What's the failure? What's the RPO times? And we'll see here as an, as an example, we've got, for under IT settings, an RTO of 30 to 60 seconds on an active passive environment, massively caveated on the links between and how long it's taken the IT admin to come in and turn it on in the first place, because there's a little bit of manual intervention there. But also you think, what about load balancing? 
how are we going to do a seamless failover, that single URL that goes between the two data centers? That could be something like a Kemp or an F5 or another ADC out in the market, or it even could be a public cloud environment, like a Route 53 or even a, a uh, Azure traffic manager uh, kind of deployment. The problem with those, though, in this kind of active, 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 passive state, the public cloud DNS management, if we think of it that way, um, is only any use it for an active, passive deployment. As soon as you need to do an active, active and put people based on proximity or put people based on their home locations, you need an ADC. To give you an idea, I was looking at the, a rough cost, and there's a guy called Sadlar Chibaro, I think is how you pronounce it. He did a, a, a presentation here last year on global server load balancing for Horizon. And one of the comments that he made was for roughly, it was like $6 a month, you could have a Azure traffic manager with a, a million connections or requests. That's a lot of requests, right? If you look at what a typical ADC is going to cost you, you're talking 30, 40, 50, 60, thousand dollars. For the, an active passive environment, it's quite a lot of money you could have invested elsewhere and used the subscription services in the public cloud. Also, if you're working with your C-level teams and they've got a massive cloud-first approach, that ticks their box for them as well. So you can say you've at least got something working in the cloud at some kind of degree. Idea on this again, completely separate environments. We're looking at site one, site two, or pod A, pod B pod A, pod B, or whatever you want to call them, they are completely separate, and the main thing there is getting your image to replicate across the two, or images in most cases. Easiest way of doing that, content libraries. People just don't use them. Most environments that we go and see, people are still thinking, well, I'm just going to use some kind of replication tool, I'm using Zerto to do this, or I'm doing X, Y, and Z, or I've got storage replication happening, and I'm going to bring it up at the secondary site when I need it, and then power it on. Just don't bother. Content library make it a subscription to your secondary location, it'll replicate it across and keep it update for you, and then when you, you can have that then as an active environment running for when you fail over, or you can have it as a manual task to spin it up in an event of a failure, or get clever and do some scripts. You press a big red button, it'll do all that for you, change the DNS entries, all that kind of stuff. So from an active-active perspective, the, the, the benefit here from an active-active point of view is the ones I mentioned before, locality of users to the services they're consuming is one. The other one is the RTO. You could get near line failover. Again, one link dependent and storage array dependent and having 100% failover in each location, then you can get near line failover. That comes with a lot of complexity in a lot of cases. And for most organizations, except if, unless you're like a bank or you've got your main trader users on this kind of environment, you could probably accept an hour, an hour of lost time because they're probably wasting an hour making a drink and talking about the latest thing on TV. So there's those kind of things that you can kind of say, well, actually, if I can wait an hour, I could just do an active passive environment, save myself some money, or even go a bit step further and go, why don't we use VMC on AWS or Azure and extend this environment into there instead? Difference being there, you have to use Horizon Cloud Service, not the on-premise stuff. Okay. Same example again. The only difference being is this is active, active. You can connect into either location at any time. App volumes. Anyone using app volumes in the audience? OK, how do you find it? Good? OK. The main thing for me on app volumes, from an active, active state, the main configuration point is a SQL always on cluster. That's going to be the thing that's going to make it fail over and get the replication of your app stacks across. Other than that, it will work pretty seamlessly from an active-active point of view. The issue you've got is the limitations of always-on clustering over a WAN link. So let's just say that that link is not performant enough, or it is congested, or there is an issue, and it misses that writes that database for whatever reason, then you're not going to get that working in the other environment. Also, though, you've probably got bigger issues because the rest of your environment's active-active, and you're really struggling to get that to fail over full stop. And I've seen these kind of things, where you go into a customer, we are active-active, that's great. They invoke DR as a test, and they fail everybody to data center two. And for arguments at the storage array, for one of my customers that I spoke to, actually couldn't contend with the load, and it actually set on fire. Those kind of stuff where they've got sequential-based um, storage arrays that don't like random, random read-writes. You've got to bear down in mind. So some considerations on here. There's more considerations than this. 
right? But these are some of the areas that you may want to think about. And we're not going to cover all of them because I've only got a, a 30 minute session or 27 minute session. And I'm actually, how far am I in now? Okay, I've got another 10 minutes. So the main thing here is that profiles and home drive data being one of the main key drivers, right? You could use UEM, but UEM doesn't like to be active active. So you have to then set two separate environments with two separate file servers. You could maybe do DFSR, but it's not officially supported, but it works if you get it right. And so there's a lot of things that can, to, to look at and say, am I happy with a unsupported config that works? Or am I fully going into a supported only configuration? If we look at profiles or even home drive data, most of our customers that we deal with will have some kind of OneDrive subscription through their Office 365. A lot of organizations I'm speaking to now are using their My Documents with OneDrive instead with uh, on-demand sync enabled within the environment, and then using the acquisition from Microsoft for FS Logix to containerize that and provide that back as a service. So it's not inflating your differential disks if you're using link clones or whatever it might be. If you're using a standard file server and you've got your, your my, my Documents and all that kind of stuff, folder redirection is still the advised route in most cases. Um, just make sure that your file servers are replicating last right win kind of scenarios if you are unlucky enough to have a user referencing the same file at each site, if it's a shared network drive for argument's sake, that kind of stuff, you will get issues of locks there as well. And that's where things like um, Panjora and Azuni, these kind of providers allow you to create a global file system across your data centers, whether it's in the public cloud or on-premise environments, and they do a more elegant way of data locking for the files that you're gonna access. Or put it into SharePoint or an equivalent document management system. That's one other way of getting around it as well. Endpoints. A lot of people look at an endpoint and they go, well, I'm moving to Horizon, I'm going to be doing VDI, I'm going to buy the cheapest cheerful endpoint on the market, and then they wonder why their experience is poor. You've still got to get a thin client that can take the offload for things like Skype for Business. You've still got to get it to be able to power the screen redraws and resolutions of the monitors that you're giving your users. And in most cases, when you start getting up to a high-end thin client, you're looking at the same cost as a PC or more. So you've got to look at the right thing client providers. There's a few out in the Solutions Expo you can go and see. Um, but it's making sure that they can take the frame buffers that are being passed to it from the Horizon environment and redrawing that back in the right time frame. So I had a customer that had a, the old um, PC over IP enabled Teradici thing clients. They've got rid of those now and they've gone purely software based with Blast Experience. Though. A lot more performant, a lot lighter on the network. It makes a lot more sense for those guys. We touched on load balance. Applications we've touched on as well around making sure they're active active in the first place. If not, my advice would be to do desktop sessions in an active active state and then go to the um, RDSH publish applications in the locations you need them. User experience is the key one as well. Having a way of monitoring that user experience, whether you're having a positive or negative impact on the environment you've deployed is key, especially in an active active environment across multiple locations. Because when a user logs into one data center and then logs into another and they get a different experience for whatever reason, you need to be able to track that. And there's various tools out there, some guys in the Solutions Expo, you can use vRealize to look at that information, but it's not quite enough in most cases. I've only got like four minutes, so I'm gonna have to skip on a little bit. Limitations that are on here, you see there are 250,000 sessions across the federated pod architecture. It's quite large. Um, the main things on there though, if we look, is a maximum of 10,000 RDSH active sessions per pod and 10,000 for a VDI environment within a pod. Seven is the maximum number of connection servers and then you've got a total number inside your pod of 350. I don't agree with this information personally, so I don't think I've ever seen 150 users on an RDSH server in my life, um, even with a massive config. So I would probably say that if you're going for RDSH, you're looking at somewhere around maybe the 30, 20, 20 to 30 user mark in most cases. Eight vCPU, 32 gig of memory on a 2016, 2019 server starting point. That is the starting point for it, okay? Limitations on VMs per core, per CPU, um, the storage limits with vSAN, they're all the considerations you have to make when you're looking at how you're gonna build out this active, active environment. Because as soon as you start getting a user density of say five or six or 20 per physical server, it's easy to get to that limitation of X number of nodes per cluster. And when you get there, it's multiple clusters, multiple pods, and you start building out this very complex design very, very quickly. Components that must run in a primary instance, UEM, Identity Manager, they don't like to be in an active, active state. They're not supported. Prime example, 
identity manager, less than four milliseconds latency, they will support it. The issue you've got is they don't support it in active, active at all, full stop. So you have to do a active standby deployment and then let the SQL database fail over in the back end and your load balancer fail you over between pod and pod B. Common challenges, unrealistic RPO and RTO as I mentioned earlier, active not capable uh, environment, network challenges, misunderstanding load balancing we mentioned earlier and not adhering to the limitations and user workflow. I'm being told it's the end of the session so I'm going to finish but I'm going to be over on the side if you want to have any conversations.